my research program is focusing on um, we have the foundation of the breeding program and we do a lot of work um, both in genome-wide association studies and genomic selection looking at corn as a source of biomass whether it's to feed ruminants or to be used for biofuel production so that's a lot of the focus that we have in the program but today I actually came here to tell you about something completely different so if you wanted to hear about any of that find me at the end of the seminar and I'll be happy to talk to you I hope I don't disappoint you but um, what I wanted to actually talk to you about is another um, area of research that we are developing in our, in our group, which is looking at breeding populations that have been selected for a relatively long period of time. Um, and then think about those populations as uh, examples of accelerated evolution, or how can we look at changes in allele frequency and other force, uh, the changes that are the consequence of selection, and then study how that frames the genome um, in ways that will help us understand what are the regions in the genome that are related to the traits of selection. So at the beginning of, of the presentation, uh, the first thing that I wanted to talk about is this idea that we look at populations, changes in allele frequencies, changes in recombination and changes in diversity, and look at those as potential signatures from selection. Um, and one of the advantages of doing that in populations that have been selected by, by human versus natural populations is that um, we, we um, have the ability, and that I'm kind of going back and forth, but one of the advantages of doing that in populations that um, human has selected a specific, this is for example in this case of chicken, um, that um, has been selected for body weight, since we know exactly what the population, uh, the goal of the selection is, we can make some inferences in terms of the regions that are affected in this genome and how it could be associated with um, body weight in chickens, for example, versus natural populations where many different forces and many different traits are selected at the same time. The other um, interesting uh, characteristics of this, um, what we call accelerated evolution experiments, is that primarily in the case of plants, we also sometimes have the ability to go back to that cycle zero. So we have information about, genomic information about that original population, genomic and phenotypic information about the selected population, and then we have, if it's a breeding program and records have been kept, we also have information about the demographic changes of that population. So we can use all that information to make inferences as to what kinds of forces have affected the, sh the shape of the genome. Um, of course, uh, I'm kind of, again, going back, but uh, the premise is that with the use of um, nowadays, I mean, this idea of looking at changes in, in the genome of selected populations to understand what are the, f the, the regions that control a trait is not new. What is new is that we can now do it at a genome-wide level, which before, people could focus on one gene at a time, okay? And as I mentioned, the premise is that because we let selection tell us or specific changes tell us what the changes are in the genome, we are expected to have um, a better, more um, constrained or accurate description of what are the important traits or what are the important regions in the genome that, that control a trait. So that's what I'm gonna um, try to talk to you about. I'm gonna do that and there should be a slide kind of sorry going back and forth, but I'm going to talk about two primary examples. I'm going to talk about a long-term selection population called Golden Glow that was selected for 30 cycles for uh, prolificacy or number of years in the plant. And then I'm going to also talk about um, this other population that was actually selected in Nebraska, the Krug uh, Divergent Selection for Seed Size. And the key word in this case is the word divergent. So Golden Glow was unidirectionally selected for increased number of years in the plant versus uh, Krug was selected both for small and large seeded populations. And um, towards the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about biology as well because we have been doing some work trying to understand what are the physiological um, com components that make these seeds become small and large. And then I'm gonna finish up, okay. so. The first population that I, I'm gonna talk about is the Golden Glow population. And the reason why this population was started to be selected back in the, in the 1970s is because 
um, as we people that have worked in, in um, any crop that, um, that is out there knows that eel is a very complex strain. And so the idea was that if we can select for a component of yield, we can make better progress over time. And this is a table out of a publication uh, by Dubik in 1997, where he looked at a series of different traits, uh, looking at varieties that were released between 1931 and 1991, to try to understand what is the correlation of each one of these different traits with yield. Um, and then he compared uh, the different eras, 1967 in this case, and 1991. And as you can see, years per plant, or prolificacy, is the trait that has a, the greatest association with yield. And this is the motivation why in 1971, John Longquist, who was Jim Coors' predecessor, so this is my predecessor, predecessor, he started selecting this particular population, Golden Glow, um, for a number of years in the plant. Golden Glow represented about 50% of the acreages of corn in Wisconsin in the 1930s when populations were, were relevant. So this is a very important population. And so this particular um, program has been now going on for more than 30 years. And it's a very simple program. Basically, we have an isolation plot, about a quarter of an acre, and we plant it to like what today is considered nor normal uh, planting densities for corn. And um, when the plants start to develop the ear shoots, we go out to this isolated plot and we select the plants that have a certain number of ear shoots or more. The last summer, it was nine ear shoots or more in the main stock. And so we select all the plants that have nine or more. We shoot back the uppermost ear of this particular plant. And we do that for a series of days, you know, for about a week. Um, and then when we achieve a more approximately 1,000 plants, we go back to this plot and um, detassel all the plants that have not been selected. And then when we have all the unselected plants detassel, then we pull the shoot bags out of these ears and we let the pollen from the selected plants pollinate the selected females. And so this is what we call, back in plant breeding 101, biparental mass selection. We select mom and we select dad. Therefore, we expect twice as much gain from selection. So one of the great things about this project is not only that ears per plant is highly correlated with yield, but the advantage that you can select it before flowering. So you can select both sides of the, of the cross, OK? So um, selection intensities in this particular population are approximately, uh, they were about 2.5 to 5% between uh, cycle 0 and cycle 12. The density of the plot was a little bit less, so that less selection index. And Currently, since cycle 13, this is a pretty intensively selected population, about 0.5 to 1%. So um, the changes that we have seen in this particular population are just tremendous. So this is a typical plan from cycle zero of the Golden Globe population. You can see maybe one or two years presented in this population, very typical of a 1930 uh, plant. This is actually an S1 out of cycle 23, and it has 22 years. We failed. We wanted one with 23, but we couldn't find it. So this one has <laughs> 22. As you can see, not all of them are really huge ears. I each one of these things, and by the way, this plant was stripped of all the ears. We did not come up with a mutant that makes a corn without ears, without leaves, I'm sorry. I got that question asked in a meeting. It's like, oh, this is a really cool mutant. Where are all the leaves? And I said, we physically stripped them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, uh, so this is a plant without the leaves that shows 22 years. So the, 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 the changes in morphology are really extreme. Um, now, um, back to numbers. From cycle, we did an evaluation by, back in cycle 24 where we compare cycle 0 and cycle 24, and there was an increase of more than threefold. We went from 1.6 to close to 4.8 years per plant on average. Um, and we did that at several different densities. And overall, what we see is a, an incredible activation of axillary Mary stems in these plants. So these plants are just capable of producing a lot of, of meristematic activity. We saw more tillers, more ears, of course, the smaller ears. Uh, and then one interesting thing that we saw in this population is that because these plants are able to produce at least one good ear, they are also very highly, they perform very highly at higher densities. So this idea that, that, that corn over time has been selected to produce at very cr more and more at very crowded environments and how prolificacy is related to that, um, this population really demonstrate that. That is, you increase the ability of a plant to produce at least one ear 
in very crowded environments, what you're indirectly doing is selecting for prolificacy, selecting for the ability of that plant to activate axillary Mary stems as soon as the opportunity arises, uh, okay? So this is from a um, phenotypic and breeding standpoint, a really interesting uh, population to, to look at. So what we did a couple years ago is um, we wanted to use this framework to try to understand, okay, we see this tremendous change in phenotype. What can we learn about the genome of these plants and can we, can we use these as an example of accelerated evolution? So we took 48 plants from the extreme population cycle zero and cycle 30. And uh, back at that time, we did what we considered to be an incredibly deep analysis of these populations. Technologies have changed so much that now I look at these numbers and I wish they were double. But um, we have about a 50% X coverage of these bulks of 48, 48 plants representing cycle zero and cycle 30. Uh, we did all kinds of filtering to make sure that we were looking at things that were meaningful. So um, positions that had less than 20 X coverage and uh, more than 89% coverage, we, we got rid of them, and this is equivalent to two standard deviations from the mean. So we ended up with a little bit more than a million SNPs um, that we use for this analysis. So these results, first of all, I want to um, acknowledge the people that have done this work. This is, um, this is a, a big project um, developed by Tim Bexinger, who is a, a grad student in my group. Um, He's a math major turning into a plant breeder, so he likes numbers and he likes uh, to think about selection. Um, so the work that he did is he took all that uh, genomic information and he analyzed these uh, populations comparing cycle zero and cycle 30 using 25 SNP sliding windows FSTs, comparing just a diversity in alleles. And he considered a region uh, something like uh, five megabases. And you can see these are the kinds of profiles that we got from this analysis. We, this is a 99.9% basically outlier test threshold and then a 99.99% threshold and we did that uh, through the whole entire genome. Um, what we found is that in the Golden Globe population there were about 28 regions um, localized uh, uh, across the genome in very, um, in very sparse, um, sparse way, uh, areas. The regions range anywhere from about 4,000 base pairs to more than nine megabases. And the level of resolution, anywhere, anywhere between zero and 73 genes in each one of these uh, regions, which is, which is relatively good. Um, in reality, 22 out of the 28 regions included five annotated genes or less. And so um, a significantly high level of resolution compared to most um, um, associations of phenotypes and genotypes. Interestingly, about 25% of these um, regions included uh, zero annotated genes, anywhere 5KB to the right and to the left. So there seems to be some areas that we found in these analyses that are actually the regulatory regions or um, places in the genome where there's no annotated gene just because Golden Glow is very different from the, from the reference genome. Um, so this is another thing that we are trying to understand and look at it more. Um, one of the, the things that people working in natural populations are immediately interested in when looking at, at these things is, are we reaching fixation? Are these regions in the genome where you have seen such a strong selection pressure that things have become fixed? And the answer in the case of the Golden Glow is that we haven't seen as much fixation as you would have expected given the extreme phenotypic characteristics of these populations. So in here, what I am showing are three just random examples, or not random, but representative examples of what we saw. And um, let me walk you through, through these. These are FST graphs of figures. And um, the red line represents cycle zero, the blue is cycle 30, and then um, the green is the FST. And here we have uh, indicated in purple the uh, region boundaries, I'm sorry, the known genes, and then the gray is the region boundaries. And interestingly, only two out of the 28 regions that were identified demonstrated a reduced heterozygosity. Um, 10 of them actually show an increase in heterozygosity, and the other 16 show no difference. Um, so in this graph, we just show the three examples where you have uh, cycle zero has a higher heterozygosity than cycle 30. Um, 
the cycle 30 higher than cycle 0 and then examples where it's the same. So that's what the A, B, and C represent. And so we are trying to also understand a little bit more where this is coming from. So the theoretical explanation for this would be that maybe we just haven't given, you know, we think 30 cycles is a long time. We think that the phenotypes that we see are very extremes, but maybe 30 cycles is not enough to move these alleles um, to the extreme of fixation. There could be also the case where overdominance could be the mode of action or variable selection environments that these, every year this population is, is, um, uh, and endures different environmental cues and in, in that changes sort of the selection target. Um, this particular idea of not enough time, if you think about it again population genetics and if you have alleles that are rare, it just takes a very long time for those alleles to um, actually appear in the population. They will appear in heterozygous forms for a long time and it just, you have to go over the bump to then see fixation, okay? So it wouldn't be unusual to think about the, the possibility that these type of traits are not very common. Prolificacy might not be a very common trait selected in, in upon any given population. So you have to increase the frequency of certain alleles before you see the decay in heterozygosity, okay? So in our mind, this is probably the most likely explanation, but again, those are some things that we are still working on. Um, the other, the other sort of interesting piece of information or ideas that we have been coining around is um, in, in the natural population and selection theory, uh, selection uh, signature literature, people are very interested in understanding whether the variability, the changes that we see due to selection are caused by variability that is already existing in the population versus mutations that have recently occurred. If you have mutations that have recently occurred, you would expect to see selection sweeps that are much wider because an allele that just comes into a population and then is drastically selected will carry along a bigger chunk of the genome with it, okay? So that is what we call a hard sweep, okay? Some mutation that is beneficial and then rapidly selected versus um, a standing variation that is present already in the populations and then undergoes through the process of recombination and can be combined into different, is present in different, uh, different types of haplotypes, okay? What we found in this population, um, so Tim did a, a k-mean cluster, clusters analysis using uh, two means, and what we see is that 26 out of 28 um, regions, and I should say that what we use here as a proxy is the size of the, of the region to tell us whether we are dealing with a hard or a soft sweep. Um, and he did the kind K means clustering, but I think it's pretty obvious when you look at this graph that the majority of the, of the sweeps that we see are more, um, in, in more likely to, to be part of this soft sweep. So standing variability has been the main source of um, of variability that this population acted upon, which is, again, uh, expected. 30 cycles is not long enough to have uh, large amounts of mutations appearing in the population. Okay, so um, today we were having lunch with the students and I mentioned about what I was gonna talk about today and you have very smart students in this group. The first question that I got is, okay, great, you're gonna talk about selection, but how can you tell whether this is selection or is this drift? And um, that's a great question, we can't. So one of the things that we have done is at least try to study to what extent we can create boundaries on what is expected to be selection to what is expected to be um, uh, due to drift. I mean, I don't think I need to go into much ma many details with this audience, but random genetic drift, this is just uh, one simulation that we did using uh, P equals Q gene frequency of 0.5 over 30 generations if we have 50 females and 50 males, and you know, the, the change in allele frequency over generations will look something like this, but it could also look like something like this or something like this. And so drift can really change allele frequencies in very drastic ways. Um, as I indicated, we don't have a, a very good way to separate those two in a situation like Golden Glow where you have only one unidirectional direction for this selection. Selection just occurred. We don't have a replication of this experiment to go back to and assess how much of that is selection and how much is drift. 
We can measure it, we can estimate it. I call these the egg graphs, um, for lack of a better terminology. And these just shows uh, allele frequencies in cycle zero and allele frequencies in cycle 30. And this is assuming something similar to what we have in our both our Golden Glow and then the crew population that I'm going to talk about of about 200 females and 1,000 males contributing to 30 cycles. And the, the black line over here would be if we have no drift. And these are some boundaries of the level of drift that is expected at um, 99 or 95% uh, limits. And compared to a situation where you have 20 females and 50 males and 30 cycles. So clearly, in these populations, the amount of drift. Did what? you guys lose the, lose the presentation in Geneva? Yes, <laughs> they did. Did I touch no, anything? No. I didn't touch anything. <laughs> I have no idea either. And Mark is gone now. <laughs> so I'll send you the slides later. You can look at them. I'm going to proceed here with uh, because I think the group has to yeah, produce a coast. Yeah. So somebody's working on it over here. Maybe. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> um, I'm not very computer savvy. So um, in the case of Golden Glow, somebody also asked me this question over lunch, and I couldn't remember the details, but I gave you the numbers pretty accurately, right? Uh, so Golden Glow, if we look at the demographic information for this particular population, the effective population size is about 667 individuals. Um, we, we did also an analysis using the 768 SNP chip from Pioneer, and that number came up to be something like 378. Of course, this is biased due to selection. So it, it, anyways, our, our effective population size is somewhere between 380 and 670. So it's a relatively large uh, effective population size and a fairly high selection intensity. So sort of the ideal setup to do the study. But in the case of the Golden Glow, again, because we only have one stream in one direction, we can't really tell you for sure, yeah, these are selected sites, these are drifted sites. That is one of the really great beauties of the next population that I want to talk to you about, which is the Krug selected population. As I indicated before, it's a divergent selection. And this particular population was also started uh, It was uh, started in Nebraska by um, William Compton. In his uh, justification for it very similar, again, looking at a, at a yield, yield component trade to try to understand how we can change, um, you know, in the case of yield, where does it come from? We have plants per unit, years per plant. Um, what, that's what the Golden Glow kind of dealt with, very affected by the environment. Then we have the seed per years and seed weight uh, trade. In addition to that, this is a target of domestication. And he started this selection project um, on this population called Krug, which is um, originally formed in Iowa and Illinois um, out of the reed, yellow dent, um, and gold mine crosses. Again, 30 cycles of selection. And this is also based on visual selection, OK? Um, they started selecting for seed size. And then over the course of the selection, they um, use weight. But it's a measurement of, of, of seed, seed volume and seed weight. The, just briefly, uh, the selection program, uh, in year one, they started with about 3,500 plants at 40,000 plants per hectare, and then they divergently selected. They picked the largest and the smallest seeded ears, and these are two independent selection programs that we're running in parallel divergently, okay? So this is where the verification sort of um, com comes in. After, um, after the first generation, all the subsequent generations included the selection of about 100 years out of 1,200 to 1,500 plants. Uh, and that amounts to a selection index of approximately 7%, okay? And a note has to be made, because I'm going to uh, refer to these later. These are uniform seeds on an ear, okay? And this was done um, in using, again, isolation, like in the case of Golden Glow. And this is the result of the selection uh, program. Again, some clear differentiations between Krug cycle zero and Krug small seeded. I'm going to, and all the slides are referred to as K1 
KSS, and then Krug Large Seated or KLS. And you can see the size of the ear has changed, the size of the kernels have changed. We see more row kernel, uh, kernel row numbers in the small seeded versus the large seeded. Um, and uh, this is the uh, mean uh, of the kernels, 200 kernel, um, 20 kernel weight for uh, uh, average for, for each one of these. Um, I said, yeah, this is, we did it with 200 kernels and this is the average per kernel, okay? In addition to that, we saw um, the reason why, actually, to be completely honest with you, the reason why we started looking at this curve population is because in addition to the bigger um, kernels in the ear, these plants also had some massive stalks. Again, remember I work with silage and biofuels, so I'm always looking for big plants. And these, I mean, in the picture, you can see some of the difference. In the field, it's just stunning. These plants are just altogether bigger, and we were very interested in understanding where that, uh, that variability came from. And so just keep that in mind because at some point I'm going to come back to that, that it is the change in, in seed size, but it's also this change in overall size of the plant, okay? Uh, for this particular experiment, what I'm going to talk about today, we did a couple of different things. We looked at, we did the same thing that we did for Golden Glow. We had cycle zero and we had uh, cycle 30, small and large. Um, and then we also derive uh, a few inbred lines out of these extreme populations just to have some inbred material to work with uh, for expression. And so we did, um, I think my next slide, uh, yeah. So this, we did similar kind of work. This is work that was um, led by Candy Hirsch. Um, she was a grad student in our program, then a postdoc, uh, Michigan State University with Robin Buell. And now she's a new faculty at University of Minnesota. And she studied this work um, very similar again, took the populations and did some se deep sequencing of bulk uh, pool materials, 48 plants from each of the populations, and we did similar type of filtering. Uh, we ended up with about 3 million SMPs in this particular population. Um, we did the same type of a study where we look at a, a scan for sweeps using 25 SMP sliding windows just to keep the noise and the error under control. And uh, when you look at the 99.9% outlier threshold, we ended up with about 94 regions that differentiated across all three of these populations, uh, about 6.4% of the total genome. Uh, a 99.99 outlier test, we ended up with 23 regions, anywhere between 0 to 233 genes per region. I have to say the median was, um, was 20 genes. So this is, there were just a few regions that that had a large number of genes. For the, ma for the majority of the regions, we had a small number of genes per regions. And about 21 regions contain either zero genes, again, non-annotated genes, or, or one gene. So in this particular case, again, a, a relatively high level of resolution. This is just a, a density, um, area density um, analysis. And it might be hard to see in the screen, but the, what I wanted to show in here, so this is the red color is cycle zero, green is cycle um, the small seeded, and then the blue is the large seeded. And interestingly, when you look at, at the SMPs per se, not the windows, just the SMP per se, one third of the polymorphic loci in Krug, uh, yellow then had reached fixation in one, the other direction or both. So a large number of the genome just moved in some extreme direction um, in, in terms of fixation. I, I don't hold my breath on, on these particular statistics because again, these are just single SNPs. There could be a lot of things that could be affected these. The thing that I find it very intriguing and that I am very, very interested in is this second bullet point in here. More than about 2,700 SMPs were fixed in cycle, in, the, in cycle 30 small and large in opposite directions, okay? So these were markers that were SMPs that were polymorphic in cycle zero and they migrated in opposite directions and we have about 2,700 of those SNPs in the genome. The majority of them are concentrated in these two particular regions of chromosome two and chromosome four. So there seems to be something quite interesting happen in these two regions of, of the genome. In this particular population, we did uh, something that was also a little bit different than, differently than uh, Golden Glow. 
we looked out also not just simply at the change in allele frequency, but at the presence of uh, copy number variation um, in, in uh, between the cycles. And we did that using sequence depth as the proxy. So we use um, the criteria of having at least, at least two standard deviations between the means of, of the two extreme populations to consider um, uh, uh, differences in, in sequen sequence depth. We found about 57 regions that had variable uh, coverage between these two populations. And this is the most complicated figure of the whole presentation. So bear with me a second because I think it's, it's worthwhile going through it. So what did I say? <laughs> oh, now you have to repeat. It's pretty. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I did not pick the colors. <laughs> Anything that is a circle of colors is kind of, right? It's kind of. Okay, so back to here. Uh, so actually, the colors are kind of nice. So <laughs> the, the circle around the, the edges of the circle, you see the 10 chromosomes of maize. Um, the, the three tracks in here are um, cycle zero, uh, large seeded, uh, small seeded. And then what we have in here are changes in, um, in allele allele frequencies uh, for each one of these regions along the 10 chromosomes, okay? You can barely see the colors, but the colors indicate whether things were fixed in one direction, in the other direction, or both, okay? The point that I want to make with these graphs, so there is also a bit more information. So the red dots in here indicate um, when we have copy number variation based on sequence, okay? When we look at sequence, based on coverage depth, and we ended up with significant differences, those were marked with those red dots. In addition to that, we also look at um, the black boxes, which are highlighted. I had to use the red circles because I couldn't barely see them myself. But these black boxes in here are sort of confirmation of the CNV using comparative genomic hybridization te uh, technology. So these are regions where the copy number variation based on sequence was confirmed by CGH. And this particular region in here, for example, land, lands directly into the large divergently fixed region that I showed before in chromosome two, where those regions were in opposite directions, okay? So we see, we see some, some interesting patterns of some things that repeat themselves. And again, I'm not trying to find regions that you see complete overlap of changes in, in allele frequency and CMVs because those are different sources of variability. But this is just to show you that the level of variability that we see is very complex. And with this type of analysis, we can start to dissect whether it's changes in allele frequencies um, or changes in, for example, copy number variation that might be affecting the variability that we see. Uh, some of those copy number variations are the consequence of um, regions that are represented, you know, different, um, I think we can call it different uh, chunks of copy number variation, or it could be just a, a, a much larger copy number variation comparison. So few individuals with large changes or many individuals with smaller changes. Remember, we are looking at a pool of, of individuals in here, okay? Um, so sort of getting to, to the, the end and just some of the confirmation that we did. Okay, all of this is, is basically exploratory uh, where we use different sources of variability to try to confirm uh, different things. But what we did also is use um, some of the resources. This is a collaboration with Sherry Flynn Garcia and uh, she has been working with seed size in the NAM. So we use some of that information. She did 20 kernel weights in the maize uh, NAM population and she identified 74 regions of the genome that were associated with seed weight. There is also quite a bit of overlap with uh, seed composition, and I'm not gonna go into the details because that's her paper, but we use that data to try to see where we saw overlap between those QTLs, and I, I, I feel like I, need, I don't need to go through the explanation of who this figure is, but you know, each one of these, to this crowd anyways, right? The mecca of um, NAM um, analysis. So this is, uh, the, each one of these red lines represents QTLs and the arrows up and down indicate which parent um, contributed that variability. But the bottom line is we found um, 12 significant uh, SNP, uh, uh, SNM SNPs that coincide with selected sweeps, and we found 18 that coincide with the copy number variation peaks um, and or the CGA. So we are working uh, to try to understand primarily in this region of chromosome one 
some significant overlap across, um, across uh, this copy number variation using the two resources and, and the QTLs that Sherry identified in the name. So we are, we are working on understanding a little bit more what are the candidate materials in here. So um, in the last few minutes, I don't even know what time I started, but I feel like I should be wrapping up, guys. This has been. So the, the last few minutes of, of the presentation, I want to actually um, gear you more towards the biology because we, that's what we want to end up, is understanding some of these traits and what is biologically meaningful. And I mentioned these to some of the students today. This is one of those things that, um, this is, by the way, work that I have been doing in collaboration with Sean Kepler. I'm going to say that at the very end, but I should have said it at the beginning. And we were um, out in the field one day looking at these plants because we were very interested in the massive um, size of the Krug large seed. But then we started making these um, pollinations using um, pollen from the large seed and material and using it mixed with current uh, pollen from the small seeded material, mix the pollen in, and then cross it by the large seeded female and the small seeded female. And I don't know if you can see in here, but there is some very distinct uh, segregation of large seeded versus the small seeded. So the, one of the interesting things about this experiment is that kernel size seems to be controlled by two main forces. One is the maternal control, right? Which you can see in here, what we have in here are, um, this is the, the small seeded female, pollinated with a large seeded male, small seeded male. Here's the large seeded female pollinated with the large seeded and the small seeded. You can see that these seeds are smaller than these. So that is the maternal effect that controls the ovule. But you also have a zinnia effect, because between the small and between the large, the pollen that is used to pollinate each one of them also has an effect, OK? So there is this very interesting dynamics between the female control and the zinnia control that we are um, trying to understand. So we have been doing some expression study now using the lines that were derived from those populations that I mentioned before. And the initial work, what we did, um, we, this is uh, work done by uh, Rajan Sikon. Uh, he's a postdoc in our group. And he looked at uh, eight day after emergent seedlings and then um, plants uh, that were pollinated and look at uh, seeds 3, 6, 12, 21, and 24 days after pollination. Uh, we used three bio reps. And uh, from five different plants from each one of these uh, populations. At this point, we are uh, looking at the populations. And the, at the time, nimble gen arrays were the best thing we can have to look at expressions in these materials. Um, I'm going to also talk about the RNA seq of the inverts per se in a minute. But how science goes, right? So pay attention. We have 3, 6, 12, 21, and 24 days. Where is the biggest differentiation that we found? right where the big hole right here is. See from 12 and 21? <laughs> Why is that always the case, right? So this is what happened. This is a PCA analysis of, um, of those um, different seeds, six days, 12 days, and 12, uh, 21 days after pollination. Purple is the large seeded. Uh, green is the small seeded. And um, so you can see that the different shapes are very close here, the, the, the pluses, the stars, the triangles, the, the circles. Everything is very close. So there is not a lot of differentiation between these populations at any of these different time, time points or tissues, except for, for 12, right? So it seems like right around this time is when something happens that differentiates the small and the large, and we have no individuals to measure it, right? So we were very frustrated at the moment, but we said, let's pursue it. So um, I'm going to go to, I'm going to uh, kind of walk you through this. So this is a, a related to that, just to understand when exactly we needed to do the sampling. This is a, we measure dry seed weight for um, the, for, for cycle, the small seeded and large seeded, and we did that in an interval of two days, from four days after pollination to 30 days after pollination. And the conclusion from here is that you can see that the purple, which represents the large seeded, it's, it starts a little bit higher in size, okay? This is, the, this is clearly a little bit higher than the small seeded. The small seeded just plateaus, sort of this is the, the, the period of cell division 
it goes on until about day 10. And then it started in day 12, the small seeded just pick up and start accumulating whatever the material it is they need to get to, feel much to, to full size. In the case of the large seeded, they have a, a prolonged, longer period of cell division, and then they pick up at a much higher uh, rate. So there seems to be something about how these large seeded seeds are controlled, that they know they need more cells to get where they need to get. And remember I showed you the picture of the large stalks? So this is something that we see in the seeds, but it's also probably the same thing that makes also these plants be bigger overall, that they, these plants are programmed to have a longer period of cell division and then um, a mass, much faster accumulation. This is, by the way, we use 200 seeds from each of the populations and each of the timelines. Um, so then we were back and did um, the same thing that we attempted before uh, uh, with, uh, with days after pollination. And here what we did, so the green represents embryo and the purple is the, is the um, I'm sorry, the, the green is the small seeded, the purple is the large seeded. And we look at embryo, we look at whole seed, and we also look at endosperm. And so I, I kind of make some squares to help you. This is a, a principal component analysis, and here we are using RNA-seq now. And first, message number one is that the embryo uh, control seems to be very similar between large and small seeded. Um, the whole seed doesn't seem to change very much either. Now, when we start looking at look, looking the, the endosperm over here for 12 seeds, there is some differentiation, but it's not very big. The greatest differentiation starts happening in the endosperm at 15 days and um, also at 18 days after pollination. So that's where it's, it coincides with the increase that we saw, or sort of the, the, the graph that we saw in terms of, of dry weight overall for these two, for these two populations. And, um, we also look at the expression pattern of some classical uh, genes from the classical uh, set that are related to uh, starch and protein, protein synthesis. And um, these are, I mean, you, what you have to see is the trend overall. So the green is the small seeded and the purple is the large seeded. And then this is just um, the reference genome. This is from the gene atlas that we developed um, some years ago. So, so the large and small seeded were tested in the same environment. This is a different environment. But just for comparison purposes, you can see that overall that's the trend, that the small seeded is higher, it stays plateau, and then the, um, the large seeded just it starts lower, but then has a higher um, accumulation potential across the, the development. So with that, um, I just want to finish up uh, with some general observations. So we have seen substantial resolution um, in the analysis of these pool samples, looking at, at what we call accelerated evolution examples. Um, selection seems to operate mostly on a standing genetic variation. And uh, this idea of having divergent populations is a very powerful tool in order to, again, differentiate things that are most likely to be selected versus uh, drift. Um, the control of, we saw cases where control landed in non-gene regions and there seems to be the control of these traits, not surprisingly, seems to be more complex than just a, a changes in allele frequencies. And um, on the biological side, um, it has helped us understand in the case of Krug, uh, there seems to be this longer period of cell division and then this accelerated rate of um, compound accumulation relative to the small seeded material. So with that, um, I want to acknowledge, like, like I mentioned, um, the middle of the presentation, this is work that I have been done in close collaboration with Sean Kepler from the Department of Agronomy. Um, I mentioned Tim, Rajan, and Candy during the presentation, but there are other folks that also participated in the work. Um, Nathan Springer uh, work on help us with the CGH, and uh, I mentioned Sherry as well. We work in close collaboration with Robin Buell at Michigan State. She does all the bioinformatic work for us. Without her, we cannot do anything. So, and then um, this was funded partially by the Department of Energy. Um, this is the funny acronym that Ed tried to say, the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center, and then uh, the USDA, and uh, all this work, the sequencing was done at JGI through, through the USDA effort. So um, with that, I want to thank you very much. These are actual ears from Golden Glow, from one plant. So 
Thank you very much uh, for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.